Welcome to AIA's Sustainability Roundtable. The purpose of today's Q&A session is to learn about sustainable projects from a few architectural experts. As you are probably aware, the design and construction industry is embracing sustainability more frequently, and architects are discussing the benefits of sustainable projects with their clients. For AIA, sustainable initiatives are a big priority. This presentation is protected by copyright laws. Therefore, none of the viewers should reproduce any of this material without requesting our permission. Additionally, the information in this program is not provided as legal advice. It is intended for informational purposes only, and no attorney-client relationship is established. Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. All are architects and members of the AIA Documents Committee and served on the task group that produced AIA's new C204 Sustainable Consultant Scope of Services and updated the D503 Sustainability Guide as well as B202 Programming Scope of Services. These documents were released in May of 2020. So first we have Tara Myers, who is Risk Manager and Principal at ESA in Nashville, Tennessee. Tara led the task group that updated the documents I just mentioned. Next we have Nada Otero, who is Senior Project Manager and Associate at Perkins & Will in Coral Gables, Florida. Also joining us today is Wolf Saar, who is a fellow of AIA and managing principal and owner of VIA Architecture in Seattle, Washington. Wolf is also chair of our AIA Documents Committee. And myself, Colleen Telling, I am manager and counsel of the AIA Contract Documents Program based in Washington, D.C. Just a brief background on the AIA Contract Documents Program. We've been publishing standard form documents since 1888, which is 132 years ago. We created these standard legal forms to make design and construction transactions more predictable. And today, AIA offers nearly 200 agreements and forms. Our documents are recognized as the industry standard because of their widespread use, as well as the volume of case history and precedent that's incorporated in the documents. The documents are drafted to represent each party's interest equally and to allocate risk to the party who's best able to manage and control that risk. Drafting an AIA contract begins by collecting and analyzing input from a wide array of sources, and it's followed by a process of drafting, reviewing, and revising many iterations of a document until the final version is approved by the committee. Market research is conducted early in the drafting process to validate issues and topics that are important to the industry. There are industry stakeholders, other AIA groups, liaisons, and subject matter experts that also contribute their knowledge and feedback on the document drafts. Most of the writing and revising of the documents is done by the AIA Contract Documents Committee members with assistance from the AIA staff attorneys. The Documents Committee is a diverse group of volunteers from across the country who serve for 10 years 
which coincides with the 10-year cycle in which we revise our documents. So knowing that background, let's begin with our first question. Panelists, thank you all very much for joining today's discussion. Uh, so I'd like to begin by asking, uh, during design, you discuss sustainable features and their benefits for a particular project. How receptive are owners to incorporating sustainable options? Thanks, Colleen. I can kick that one off. Um, our firm here in Nashville, we do a lot of work across the country in healthcare market, and we have several of our hospital projects that pursue LEED or other certifications such as Green Globes, as well as many owners that don't want, they want the health and wellness benefits of designing a sustainable building, but they don't actually want to pursue certification. So these healthcare clients recognize the benefits of sustainable design for their patients, as well as their staff and overall operational costs. And like, unlike other, some other building types, these hospitals run 24-7, and they usually they have unusually a large amounts of water and power, so any reductions we can achieve in these areas can have a great impact on their bottom lines. And they also value other sustainable design features, such as flexibility, acoustics, access to views of nature, and opportunities to improve indoor air quality. The project you see here is the Advent Health Kissimmee Bed Tower, which is a LEED uh, healthcare certified project in Kissimmee, Florida. And we've worked on a number of projects for Advent Health, which is formerly Florida Hospital, and LEED certification is a part of our services for most all of those projects. And then in contrast, we have other projects where we do not pursue certification, but sustainable design is still important to the client. So this project is the Anna Shaw Children's Institute, and it's an example where the owner chose not to pursue certification, but it still incorporated many sustainable features in the design. Um, careful consideration was taken into the building siding to help preserve trees and work with the existing grades, and the design also limits sun exposure and glare while still creating access to views of nature throughout the facility. So as you can see, there are just a, a variety of ways we respond to this with our clients. Thank you, Colleen. Historically, educational owners support incorporating sustainable features, especially if it will reduce their operational cost and if they can be used as a learning tool for students in K through 12 and higher ed buildings. 21st century learning environments and a high performance building have become the new normal for an institution that has committed to transform the face of public education in the country. The Academic Support Center at Miami-Dade College's Kendall Campus is a 135,000 square foot building centralizing all student services departments for more than 120,000 students. The project itself is a learning tool, helping the college achieve its 10 learning outcomes, among which is to describe how natural systems function and recognize the impact humans make on the environment. To that end, the project includes two outdoor learning spaces, one of these spaces surrounds a rain clock, which is a dry retention structure that adjusts seasonally to spatially register stormwater amounts. An open grid paving system conceals a shallow custom rainwater cistern by the main entry, illustrating roof rainwater harvesting. The building reutilizes coquina limestone excavated for foundations into low linear retaining wall elements that loosely define planted zones and exterior pedestrian ramps and steps. A series of sustainable strategies were implemented aimed at reducing the energy consumption of the building while keeping comfortable conditions for students and staff to fulfill their activities. These strategies include abundant and controlled daylighting to reduce energy use from artificial lighting, an underfloor air distribution system for the offices to reduce the chill water consumption while providing a high level of controllability, and LED lighting with high luminous efficacy lighting fixtures, controlled by daylighting, and motion sensors that allow a lighting power density reduction of 44%. The costs associated with LEED implementation today have stabilized, and options in the certification systems make it very feasible for owners to achieve certification without adding excessive costs to their projects. Additionally, cities such as Miami and Miami Beach 
offer incentives and density bonuses for private developments over 50,000 square feet that pursue certifications of lead silver, gold, or platinum and meet the requirements of their sustainability and resiliency ordinances and municipal codes. In Seattle, uh, we've been also uh, using the incentive uh, program to um, incentivize owners to go to um, LEED um, or other certification systems. This project uh, called Spire is a 42-story condominium uh, in downtown Seattle. Uh, if we had not taken advantage of the incentive program on this one, we would have been building about a 30-story tower. In this case, uh, the owner uh, uh, has pursued lead gold uh, for this project, and they also pay into a city affordable housing fund. And combined, those two um, uh, requirements uh, result in a taller, uh, denser tower. Also in Washington State, um, publicly funded affordable housing projects are required to achieve certification under the state's Evergreen Sustainable Development Standard, ESDS for short. Um, this is similar to LEED in that it uses a point system um, to achieve different levels of sustainability. The project here is a affordable senior housing project uh, towards the north end of Seattle. Sustainable certification is becoming an increasing differentiator uh, for leasing or selling multifamily properties. Therefore, clients may choose to voluntarily pursue lead gold or silver in order to be able to demonstrate their concern for the planet to renters or buyers. The Joseph Arnold lofts actually didn't pursue lead, they pursued green globes, and we achieved a three globes um, certification on this and its sister project, which you'll see later in the presentation. Also, it's important to remember that some funding sources um, require uh, sustainable uh, development. They're reserved for projects that are sustainably designed and built. That's great. These all sound like very interesting design projects to have been a part of and uh, also engage in various certification systems. Um, I want to share here uh, just a sustainability fact about uh, what are the top triggers driving green building. Uh, the number one is a request from clients to have green facilities. Uh, in second place, uh, this is driven by environmental regulations, and 27% uh, of respondents in this survey um, elected that they want healthier buildings. So that could come from tenants, customers, um, other than the owner client. Next, I'd like to ask how you all handle a situation where an owner is interested in sustainable features but doesn't want to pursue formal certification. Yes, our, our firm's culture is deeply rooted in sustainability and social justice. Higher education clients sometimes have initial concerns with pursuing certifications usually as a result of financial constraints. Our approach is to guide and educate clients on the options and benefits of building designs that incorporate sustainable strategies and the value to their academic mission, even if the project is not certified. With higher education clients, obtaining a minimum certification of silver can often be a state requirement for funding. If universities can achieve reduced waste, energy, and operational cost savings, improve occupant health and comfort, minimize the environmental impact, and are able to share with their students the benefits for the greater good of society, we find that they become receptive to certification. As a result, as a design firm, we incorporate sustainable strategies such as high-performing energy systems, site orientation techniques, low-emitting materials, daylighting, 
and adaptability for future use, and climate change on all projects. Once the client understands the expansive benefits, they partner with the design team and become champions for sustainability initiatives and certification. The project that you see on the screen, the University of Florida's Clinical and Translation Research Building in Gainesville, is an example of this partnering. The central pillar of the philosophy behind the design is that sustaining life itself provides healing. A building that promotes healing and responds to the emergent site cultural and environmental forces is in perfect alignment with the University of Florida's commitment to continue to make its campus a sustainable and attractive place to learn, work, and live. The facility achieved USGBC's LEED Platinum certification using strategies including vegetated roof assemblies, the use of reclaimed water from the university's central plant for irrigation, rain and condensate water collection on a 10,000-gallon underground cistern, day lighting harvesting, solar water heaters, high efficiency lighting, and HVAC systems. The platinum level of performance was achieved through the use of a 44 kW photovoltaic system that met 15 to 20 percent of the building's electricity demands and by increasing construction waste diversion from landfills to 95 percent for metals, paper, and cardboard, 100 percent for soils and biomass, 90% for rigid foam, carpet, and insulation, and 80% for all others. You know, owners often um, reach out to us regarding sustainable features on their buildings, but as Nada mentioned, they don't really have the budget or don't want to spend the money uh, for a certification, uh, a true formal certification process. Um, in Washington State, as with many other states and jurisdictions, the energy code is one of the most stringent in the country. So even if we don't go through a formal certification process, buildings are high performing from an energy standpoint already. Um, but we have clients that ask us to use the LEED certified or LEED silver, typically uh, those standards, without going through the formal certification process. When we, when we approach projects like that, we still do the normal process, which is uh, having an eco charrette early in the project uh, to determine what credits we will pursue and who's responsible for those credits. Um, but we may actually deviate a little bit from uh, items like the prerequisites. I also think it's important to mention that, as I showed you on the Joseph Arnold loss earlier, that client um, didn't want to go through the lead process because they perceived it as, a, as expensive and lengthy, um, but they did find a certification process, the Green Globes process, which they found to be easier to um, interact with and made that choice and directed us to design to those standards. Excellent. Again, all very informative. Uh, so assuming that an owner is interested in sustainability, contractually speaking, how would you structure your agreement with an owner to detail what the project's sustainable goals will be and assign responsibilities to meet those goals? Well, I'll, I'll pick that one up. First, uh, we execute an owner-architect agreement often the B103 in our case, or sometimes a B101. If the owner indicates interest in having a sustainable project, we'll note that in the agreement, and then attach an exhibit like AIA's E204, where we establish a sustainability plan, a sustain, sustainable objectives, and sustainable measures. As the E204 is a relatively new document, we do face some challenges from some owners who have their own manuscript document, and even when using the B103 or B101, are resistant to introducing yet another exhibit. This, I'm convinced, will evolve over time and with education. But in the meantime, we sometimes uh, bring in key concepts from the E204 into our B103 or B101 owner architect agreements. On the North Haven project, we actually used the B108, um, as this is a HUD-funded project. 
The B-108 is a 2009 document, and although it includes language about sustainable design, it does not include references to the E-204 Sustainable Projects exhibit, as you would see in the 2017 versions of the B-101 and B-103. A very useful tool for us has been using the D-503, the Guide uh, for Sustainable Practice. Since it's an original publication and, and find it to be a valuable tool for those cases where the E-204 is not used. Thanks, Wolf. So as, as both Wolf and Nada mentioned earlier, we have also seen many jurisdictions across the country where the local zoning or the building codes have adopted sustainability requirements and or they provide incentives for achieving certain goals such as LEED certification. And our firm is currently working on a project, it's a hotel in Nashville, Tennessee, where the downtown code for the project site allows for two additional stories in height for buildings that achieve LEED certification. And we knew this early on in the project that the owner wanted to maximize the height for the building and therefore achieving LEED would be a significant goal. And so we used the AIA B101 for the design agreement and attached an E204 to outline the sustainability terms and conditions and services related to the owner's sustainability um, objectives and goals for the project. And Tara, can I ask you, how was the E204 useful for that design project? Sure. So the E204 helped to guide the relationship really between the owner, the architect, and the contractor as it relates to the execution and achievement of sustainable goals on the project. We often, you know, we have an outside consultant assisting us with tracking the lead certifications on the project, which is often how we do it in our firm. And as in the contracts that were put in place before the creation of the new C204 agreement, the use of the E204 made the most sense for us. And the consultant worked with us during contract negotiations to fill in any required information in the E204, uh, such as the number of meetings that were going to be needed to define and develop the, and incorporate the sustainable measures into the documents, and the number of submittals to the certifying authority, all the things that are included in their fee. And then as the team moves through the design process, the E204 helps all parties understand their roles. Um, but it can be especially beneficial with owners who have never done a sustainable project as it really helps them to walk through the process and they'll see how each party will be involved from start to finish on a project. Great. Um, so I'd like to ask next if anyone has experience with owners who contract directly with consultants as opposed to architects uh, for their sustainable project needs. So I'll jump in on that one too, because in fact, yes, we, as I mentioned before, we partner with an outside consultant for most of our projects that are seeking some sort of sustainable certification. We have a large number of individuals on our staff who have sustainable accreditation, such as LEED or WELL, but we found that if we can keep them focused on the design and implementing the owner's sustainable objectives, and we let an outside group focus on the paperwork and the communication with the certifying agency, that that helps um, speed things along within our firm. So on some projects, that consultant is under our contract, and in other cases, they are hired directly by the owner. And in the past, when they have contra contracted directly with the owner, it was likely under some sort of proposal letter or custom agreement. But now we have the new AIA document, the new C204 agreement, which is the owner and consultant um, sustainability consultant scope of services, and that can be paired with a C-103 owner consultant agreement without a predefined scope, and you, they use the new C-204 sustainable project services scoping document to define their scope. So if the owner is using an E-204 with the architect and the contractor, this will help maintain consistency and language between all of these agreements. You can see here in the diagram that the, um, um, the sustainability consultant is paired with the owner there through the C-103 and the C-204, but the architect consultants and the contractors and even the subcontractors will all still have roles that can be defined in the E-204 agreement. Yeah, like Tara just said, generally we see this consultant in the role of facilitating the process and being responsible for administrative functions. As architect and designer, we are still responsible for designing uh, to the sustainable um, criteria that we've um, agreed to. 
But I like the C204 because now when an owner asks about how to, you know they're going to contract with a sustainability consultant, um, we can offer them a solution um, for those cases where they contract directly for sustainable uh, sustainability services. And can any of you recommend resources where architects and consultants can gain an overview of certification systems and risk factors about a sustainable project? I can address that. Um, yes, in terms of certification systems, D503 is an excellent resource for architects and consultants on options for the commonly used sustainability certification systems. And it offers guidance on considerations for selecting the correct one for your project. Commonly known systems such as LEED, FitWell, Energy Star, and Green Globes are described generally in the guide, along with other programs gaining more notice, such as BOMA 360, Building Research Establishment Environmental Assessment Method, or BREAM, the International Living Futures Institute, Passive House, and Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating Systems, known as STARS. Municipal codes are catching up to new options and strategies and certification systems as well. Local, state, and counties may also offer options, such as the Florida Green Building Coalition, specific to certain project types. Our firm finds that clients are open to non-traditional certification systems that can achieve the sustainability goals set for their projects. Thanks, Nita. Yeah, there, the, um, the D503, we go, went through quite a process to um, understand the different systems that are out there. And there are many that we didn't even list. There are some very specialized uh, certification systems for for instance, transit systems or uh, transportation projects um, or educational facilities as well. Um, in terms of risk factors, the D503 um, has a lot of information about this for architects, owners, contractors that are engaged in a sustainable project. Amongst this group, I'm, I'm probably the oldest and I've been on the committee for 10 years. So I, when I started out, we were developing the first D503, which now is in its third iteration. Um, but even then, we were looking at those um, risk factors and how to address those. At that time, we were providing model language, which um, has now been incorporated in the documents like the E204 and the um, uh, C204. Um, the allocation of risk to the appropriate party that has the best ability to manage the risk, uh, whether that be the architect, owner, or contractor, is a major um, premise behind um, the concepts that are described in the, in the guide. The articles are useful um, in understanding the lay of the land, the different systems, including jurisdictional systems like the IGCC and ASHRAE, 189.1. The specific contract language discussions address the unique elements associated uh, with a sustainable project, where the risks lie, and how to mit mitigate those. Very good. Well, we've talked about tools that are available through AIA to architects and consultants uh, to guide them through processes like establishing a sustainable objective, as well as the D503 guide about broader sustainability topics. I'm interested to hear about projects that you all have been involved with that pursued or achieved a certain type of certification. Yeah, maybe I'll jump in here and um talk about one of my favorite projects, which is the Angle Lake uh, uh, Transit Facility in Federal Way, Washington. This is just south of uh, Seattle-Tacoma International Airport, and right now is the terminus of our uh, growing, um, our southern terminus of our growing light rail system in the Puget Sound. Angle Lake Station is unique because it's like a lot of transit um, stations, it's open air. 
So it doesn't have all the mechanical systems that you might see in a traditional building. Um, so it created some challenges to certify this um, due to that minimal use of indoor mechanical systems and the high level of energy use that's associated with a transit facility. What we did here, and we achieved uh, lead gold on this one, the first uh, transit station to achieve this in the United States, uh, we introduced rooftop photovoltaic arrays uh, that actually provide power to the, um, the staff uh, offices and other uh, facilities within this project. Uh, rainwater harvesting for landscape and irrigation. Um, we also used it as a demonstration project. So there is our interpretive signage and information for the public to learn about sustainable design. And I think that's a really important piece to focus on um, as we make the public more aware of sustainability. Um, I think we'll see it more and more just be part of the norm. A um, few things that we did, like reducing the platform length to reduce embodied energy and materials that don't immediately come to mind, but those things do save energy. We also introduced fewer systems, such as lighting and speakers. Um, we reduced maintenance and savings in the construction cost as a result of having less systems in, in this project. The other one that I wanted to show you is what we talked about earlier, uh, the Joseph Arnold Lofts, but also its sister project, the Walton Lofts. Both of these projects uh, pursued green globes, three globes, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Joseph Arnold Lofts was the first multifamily project in Seattle to achieve this. And it really led the way for future projects in the city and in the region. The Walton Lofts uh, is its sister project, um, and it's constructed a couple of years after the Joseph Arnold. So the image on the left is, is the, the Joseph Arnold, which we affectionately call the Joe. And then on the right, the two images are of the Walton um, Lofts. Green globes, three globes. And in this one, we introduced an educational component highlighting an urban watershed and a community pea patch that's adjacent to the project. So we, I don't have an image of it here, but we introduced um, downspouts that were done in a, in a decorative way that actually celebrated the water coming off the roof down into this um, garden area that was along the street. And this street uh, is an urban watershed and has been developed as such for years. So other projects up the street um, also have done similar artistic um, interpretations and have really used this urban watershed. Very interesting feature in our city. Thanks, Wolf. So for our firm, um, over the past several years, LEED and Green Globes also have probably been the predominant certifications that we've been seeing in most of our markets. But lately, um, we've had newer systems such as Well Building and FitWell that are really starting to gain traction and momentum. And I anticipate in light of the current pandemic that these will continue to grow in popularity. So the project you see here, uh, we just finished a well building project for DPR Construction's local Nashville office. And for this project, the design focused on the health and wellness of their employees, and it really included a lot of involvement from their staff during the design process. They were very integral to, um, we participated in a lot of charrettes and a lot of really, they dove deeply into the planning process with us. And flexibility and access to natural light, as well as spaces for their staff to collaborate and de-stress were really all important considerations in that design. Um, as you can see here from the pictures, they've got some great spaces for their employees, um, as well as a really great work environment for them to, to do their jobs. So, Thank you, Tara. I'll share information about the L'Oreal Corporate Research and Innovation Center in Rio de Janeiro. This project achieved a US GBC LEED Gold certification 
It houses research, testing, and production of cosmetic products. It's the first of its kind in Latin America. Designed for a global cosmetic company, the facility transforms the company's research processes and collaborative models allow for more dynamic, integrated approaches to production and testing. Interfering with the existing ecology as minimally as possible, the design siting and overall form responds to an existing hill, while its two-story structure is elevated above parking. From the onset of the project, the design team sought to implement resilient strategies that allowed the building to better respond to both acute and systemic stressors. Not only proper solar orientation and strategic location of glazing was implemented, but a series of strategies to reduce the carbon footprint of the building, such as high-performance HVAC systems and on-site renewable. Besides the use of efficient HVAC system, the building has installed on the roof a PV array rated with a capacity of 390 kWp, which results in an annual energy cost savings of 32% and energy use savings equivalent to 35%. In all, the building meets the 2030 challenge for overall carbon reduction with a predicted EUI of 61.3 kBTU energy consumed per square foot per year. This is 73% below the local average of 228 kBTU energy per square feet per year. The facility is raised over the parking to protect it from the rising levels of the Bay of Guanabara, and its structural system is a sort of kit on parts that allows for internal program flexibility. It was conceived as a framework capable of being deconstructed at the end of life of the building. The building, working seamlessly with the site, manages and treats 100% of the rainwater and wastewater on site without the use of chemicals. Excess runoff is treated to a high degree and discharged to the bay. We've been fortunate to receive a few awards on this project, and we're very proud of what it was able to attain for this client. Thank you, Nada. Um, here I'd like to just share a slide about the green building systems that are most common. Um, it probably comes as no surprise that LEED is in the top spot as the 80, at 80% 80 uh, the most commonly referenced, followed by the Living Building Challenge and WELL tied at 21%. Uh, at 14% there's Passive House, Green Globes 12%. Uh, fit well, and the international systems are tied at 6%. So some cities are taking a closer look at their greenhouse gas emissions and using that information to inform decisions about how to reduce their energy levels. Um, here in D.C., 74% of greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. By 2032, the city um, has set a goal to cut energy use by 50%, have 50% renewable energy, and cut greenhouse gas emissions in half. D.C. has committed to being carbon neutral by 2050 and being mindful of its impact on the environment uh, the city adopted the D.C. Green Building Act in 2006, um, and that requires all non-residential public buildings to meet or exceed the LEED silver level. As of 2012, that act requires all new private development projects that are 50,000 square feet or larger to meet or exceed LEED certified. So I'd like to ask you all, do you encounter any unique certification systems like DCs at your local levels? Well, I'll jump in. I, I had mentioned earlier uh, the Evergreen Sustainable Development Standards. Maybe I'll dig into that a little bit here. As mentioned before, all publicly funded affordable housing projects in Washington State are um, uh, required to meet a, the requirements of the sustainable certification system called Evergreen Sustainable Development Standards, or ESDS for short. The system has, a, has mandatory provisions, much like the prerequisites you might see in LEED, 
Um, and a minimum of 50 points need to be achieved for new construction, like the North Haven Senior Living uh, Project. Um, the, the nice thing about ESDS is that it doesn't just consider the energy aspects, but it also uh, addresses social and economic aspects. Um, the economic aspects, obviously, providing affordable housing um, is, is one of the key premises here. Um, the, the socially, um, we design uh, to the um, handicap standards, obviously, through ADA and FHA uh, requirements, but we also employ universal design standards and use uh, those to achieve some of the points uh, required by the ESDS. We also have in the Puget Sound uh, the uh, system called Built Green, which uh, in King and Snohomish counties um, is an alternative uh, approach. Um, and these are administered by the Master Builders Association, and it addresses new housing of all types, so single family as well as multifamily, and renovations um, as well. It utilizes a checklist and a verification process to make sure that the standards are being met. And Wolf, you have experience with Passive House and Green Globes. I know you've mentioned that uh, in our presentation. Can you share information about projects that were designed under those systems? Sure. Um, I think the next slide has some images of um, some of those projects. Um, there's a Joseph Arnold and the Walton Lofts. Now you get to see the out, outside of the Walton Lofts. Uh, and there on the lower right, that urban watershed I mentioned um, along the public right-of-way. Um, but let me focus just for a moment on Passive House. Uh, the, the Passive House project here, the Brecon, Apartments is a project we're designing in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, the, the city of Vancouver required uh, the use of passive house um, for a period of time, and this is how this was, this was designed under those standards. Passive house is addressed in the D503 guide, by the way, and it really requires more than just um, designing to the standards. It actually, we have uh, Passive House certified uh, architects uh, on staff, both in our uh, British Columbia office as well as in Washington State and California. Uh, we find that Passive House is more uh, prevalent in Canada than it is uh, down in Washington State currently, although we do have some projects in Washington State uh, that are designed to the Passive House. Uh, standards. And uh, can I ask how you all balance designing for environmental factors like severe weather events um, while addressing various code requirements? I'll tackle that one since Miami is a great example of climate change and impacting the built environment. Downtown developments in beach areas in Florida and in other coastal states need to be sensitive to design to environmental factors such as sea level rise and flooding. Some zoning and building codes, however, have not yet caught up with climate change and resiliency solutions. So designers have to be proactive in designing buildings that go beyond the minimum code requirements and are adaptable, including elevating building systems and services above the ground level to be less susceptible to sea level rise or flooding during emergencies and natural events. These new strategies may create higher upfront costs for the project. However, the long-term financial benefits are very important for society and need to be discussed with your clients early in the project. Additionally. It's important during the design process to investigate all financial incentives and savings available from mortgages, building insurance, and zoning initiatives to mitigate any upfront cost. The design professional should communicate with the local agencies having jurisdiction to be a resource in revising outdated zoning and building codes to incorporate new strategies that address climate changes. The Sustainable Projects Guide, D 
503, as mentioned previously, also offers important information and resources, including links to the AIA Resiliency and Adaptation Initiative, current articles and code resources that will benefit your project design. Well, a timely topic these days is redesigning to minimize the spread of coronavirus. Uh, arguably, sustainability extends to health and wellness, which the Well Certification Program is designed around. Is there a way to capture those points using AIA contracts? So yes, definitely, and that can be done by really using any of the AIA sustainability documents, such as the E204 or the C204. Uh, those agreements are written really so that they can be flexible enough to work for any type of sustainable goals or cert certification system. So whether you're pursuing LEED, Green Globes, uh, WELL, FIT WELL, it should work for all of them. Um, the project that we have here is the, um, the Gulch Crossing Office Building which is our office building in Nashville. We occupy the top two floors of that, and we used AIA documents on both the core shell building as well as our tenant build out. Uh, the building itself is LEED Gold certified, and our office achieved LEED Platinum, and we are currently pursuing FitWell certification for our office as well. So for both of those projects, we were very concerned with creating a design that spoke to the health and wellness of not only our staff, but the other building occupants and the surrounding community. I will say, um, I guess maybe a word of caution that in regards to coronavirus specifically, I think there are many recent articles and material out on the market related to material selections and infection control, as well as ongoing debates about how, you know, how are design solutions going to respond and to help control the spread of this disease. And with any sustainable design, I think architects should avoid taking responsibility or taking on responsibility for products or systems that you don't know a lot about or that haven't been fully tested yet. So unless your firm is different than mine, um, you likely don't have a toxicologist on your staff and you should leave the determination as to what products are safe or unsafe to people who have extensive experience in those areas of study. And that doesn't mean that you can't implement um, safe and, and tried and tested um, features into your projects, but I think it just means be cautious when you're on the cutting edge of of new things like the coronavirus. Yeah, I'll agree with that, Tara. It is very important to recognize that no one is an expert in COVID-19 or really for any infections that we don't know about yet. Owners and architects should make sure they're covered and that they understand their contractual responsibilities during these unprecedented times. Consulting with legal experts, reviewing available AIA contract documents and resources are key steps in protecting your architectural practice, as you noted. Are any of you finding products or materials that are not compatible with COVID uh, cleaning procedures? I'll take that one, um, Colleen. We, like most offices, you know, immediately went to uh, work from home um, uh, back in March uh, when the, the state directive came down. Um, but as we've... Um, used our office more recently kind of on a voluntary basis we um, put into place protocols to make sure that as people re-enter the workplace that they're uh, being as safe as possible things like wearing masks and things like that but one of the um, interesting pieces is that when we designed our office space uh, we we designed it very sustainably and we found a really great countertop, which you will see everywhere in our office, on our conference tables, next to the copier, and even at the front desk, that is a sustainable project manufactured locally that uses paper um, as part of its composition. Well, what we discovered uh, soon after COVID was that it is ruined if you use a disinfectant like bleach on it. Um, now, who would have known back when we were designing this that we would be in a pandemic situation and be applying Clorox wipes or bleach to our, our surfaces? So we are learning, just like everybody else, um, about uh, you know, the, compa the compatibility of project, products um, that, and 
you know, how you disinfect them and how you maintain them in a, a healthful way. You know, what's interesting is that the AIA sustainability documents address this issue. They provide guidance for new but unproven materials. And it's really important if, if, there's, if you read anything in the D503 guide, read that portion. Um, it's, it's very indicative of, or very instructive really, of how to approach new unproven materials um, and engaging the owner in the decision to um, really take a risk on a new material that maybe has great sustainability uh, characteristics, but maybe doesn't quite perform um, in, other, uh, in other aspects. I'd also like to add that, like you know, we've all heard uh, about you know, redesigning the workplace and such, we do, our, a great portion of our practice is in senior housing. And we have been talking with our senior housing clients and they have been looking to us as thought leaders, especially uh, when designing for, for memory care. So we're talking about changing materials and the way they use uh, different common areas in their facilities, such as dining rooms, to adapt to a post-COVID world. Um, for instance, we, we already design um, the memory care uh, floors to not be big communal areas, that we try to break them up into households. And, and really pushing that idea to limit the groups to 12 to 16 people, you start to create your little groups that, that don't, you know, that are safe. Um, Social distancing in communal areas, uh, addressing contact with loved ones. It's really important for people who live in assisted living not to be isolated from their families, but their families cannot visit. My mother-in-law happens to live in this project that, that uh, we designed, and we haven't seen her for months. Uh, we communicate with her um, virtually, uh, but we have not had any physical contact during this time. And of course, disinfection and issues like introducing sustainable materials that cannot be disinfected is a key concern uh, when designing senior facilities. Well, thank you very much to our panelists for sharing your experiences, knowledge, and insight about sustainable projects. Uh, this is all very valuable information and useful to other architects who are working with clients to implement sustainable features in their work. Uh, we've learned a lot about sustainability trends in each of your regions and certification systems that clients pursue, as well as navigating the steps of sustainable design by using AIA resources like the D503 guide, uh, the E204 Sustainable Projects Exhibit, and C204 Sustainable Consultant Scope of Services. So if our audience has uh, any questions, they are welcome to go to our LEARN webpage at aiacontracts.org slash learn. Uh, there are free samples of all of our contract documents there. Uh, any questions about the content of our documents can be directed to docinfo at aiacontracts.org or the phone number shown. And questions regarding tech support uh, can be emailed to techsupport at aiacontracts.org or by dialing the 800 number shown. So once again, thank you very much to our panelists and audience. We hope that you've enjoyed this program. Thank you.